Thoughts are the thing that men fear the most, even more than losing their jobs or dying. Thought is terrible and destroying, and it is cruel to power, established institutions, and comfortable habits. Thought is rebellious and revolutionary. It looks straight into the depths of darkness without fear. The most powerful, fleeting, and freeing thing about being human is his ability to think. It's also where all the light in the universe comes from. Bertrand Russell was a philosopher and mathematician who won the Nobel Prize. Up to this point, everything that has been said is completely true. As I learned when I had an awakening, all it takes is one thought to change your whole life. With just one thought, someone could end up in jail for the rest of their life, or that thought could lead to a life full of wealth and comfort. The person thinking about something is the only one who can decide if their thoughts are bad or good and fun for them and those around them. By far, the most important thing in the world are the ideas that people come up with. There was no such thing as the United States of America before it was actually put into action. A lot of things started out as ideas in people's minds before they became real things. The course of your life is determined by the thoughts you have, and right now, you and I are both made up of all the thoughts we have had so far. At this point, that's the best we can hope for ourselves. For all of our lives, we've either done what we thought was right, or what other people thought was right. It's possible to think and have thoughts. To think is to have thoughts. Your main way of thinking is the most important thing about you. Everything else in your life is based on this one thing, how much money you make, where you live, what you wear, how much schooling you have, how you talk to people, who you marry, and how many kids you have. It's likely that a man's decision to serve in the military for a while as part of being drafted into the service was the last thing on his mind when he made his choice, unless something came to mind directly because of someone else's thought. And yet, the fact that he is being chosen is because of an idea that was come up with by the people who make decisions. This is the case since he is being called up. One great thought can put you on the path to having a lot of money. You can let your mind go in any way you want when you sit down and think about something on a Sunday morning or afternoon. As soon as you start coming up with new ideas, the law of numbers will start to work in your favor. You are the only one who needs to start it. Let's say you decide to spend an hour a day for six months coming up with ideas that explore your own potential as well as the wants and needs of the people you would be helping. Also, let's say you promise to do this so that you can help the people you will be helping. Do you think you could come up with five new ideas every day for six months? Thanks to working together, my business partner Lloyd Conan and I made a product that has sold more than $25 million. This was possible because we worked together. We were able to finish everything in a little over a month. An idea turns into a thing in the end. In Japan, there are people who can tell 99% of the time what gender a baby chicken is by looking at its ogenitalia. Even though it might not be easy at first glance to tell the difference between male and female young chicks, they are able to do it. While this method is very accurate, there is no other method that has been approved by scientific study that even comes close. Some people do it without even thinking about it. They don't need any proof because they have a gut feeling about which chicks will grow up to be boys and which will grow up to be females. They just know it. People who want to become chicken sexes can only learn by watching more experienced workers do their job and not being able to explain how they sex hands. If someone wants to become a chicken sexer, they need to learn the job by watching what more experienced workers do. You can see how powerful perception is just by the fact that I can write this. Some people think that the best way to come up with really great ideas is to let our instincts and mind work together as guides. That's an interesting option. When you're not writing, always carry a folded piece of paper and something to write with you. This should be something that you do without thinking during the day. A lot of the time, people get thoughts when they least expect it, like while they are walking, driving, taking a shower, or eating. 
they are most likely to be around at breakfast, lunch, or while you're eating. This state of thought, which I call neutral, makes it possible for ideas to come to the surface and be heard. There's no guarantee that we'll be most creative during our designated think time. However, if we bury the problem we're trying to solve deep in our minds, it seems that a large part of our subconscious mind keeps working on it even when we're focused on something else. It doesn't matter what problem we're trying to solve. This is still true. When it thinks it has found a solution, it waits for a while of silence before bringing it to the surface so that it can be looked over. This gives the answer a chance to be properly evaluated. We need to write down these ideas right away so that we can give them the attention they deserve. Teilhard de Chardin says that the noosphere is an unseen layer of human intelligence that surrounds the Earth like a shell. I think that our instincts can help us learn more about this. This is something we might be able to do by thinking back to memories from a long time ago. We all have seen it work for ourselves at some point in our lives, but no one can explain how it does what it does. Planting a problem or question deep in the mind by first turning it in every direction while making a strong conscious effort to solve it often leads to a solution coming to us out of the blue. You have to consciously work hard to solve the problem so if you look at it in different directions while doing so, it will also change directions while you are doing so. One way to do this is to spin the problem or topic in every direction possible. There is a common answer. Why in the world didn't I see that when we turned it over in our minds using the rotisserie of our awareness? But it wasn't clear right away what was going on. People who depend on it happening expect it to happen and wait for it to happen, like a ship's watch waiting for a light in the dark, seem to run into it more often than people who don't depend on it happening. If you haven't tried this idea before, you're missing out on an experience that is both very interesting and very rewarding. These Japanese chicken sexes can tell the difference between male and female chicks, and we can tell the difference between right and wrong in many situations. Women are often better at following their gut than men because they seem to be more in touch with them than men. They probably have had to do this throughout history because women haven't been able to compete with men on a more basic level because they aren't as strong. This could be the reason they had to do it. Because of recent events, I bought my 11-year-old grandson lunch. As we were walking back to the van after the event, we saw a group of young men using pickaxes and shovels to destroy a gas station. While we were still on our way, we could see this action. They only had shorts on up to their waists and worked in thick dust clouds while picking up and moving big pieces of concrete with heavy tools, picks and jackhammers. I stopped completely and looked at Danny. As I did so, I pointed to the younger workers and asked him if this was the kind of job he could see himself doing when he got older. After looking at them for a while, he showed that he didn't like them by shaking his head. During our trip, Danny and I were talking about how I think people whose jobs are mostly physical are not reaching their full potential because they are not mentally pushing themselves. The same is true for both men and women, men and women who think do. By working together, we can think more clearly and effectively, and our ideas can help more people than we could ever do by working alone. Plus, it's better for our health, which is an extra plus. Then there's the fun of using our bodies for more enjoyable things, like tennis, golf, sailing, fishing, swimming, camping, hiking, mountain climbing, running, and exercise. All of these things are more fun when we use our bodies. People who know Danny have heard that he wants to work in either science or archaeology one day. Danny is treating the idea of going to college as if it were a given, even if he doesn't end up picking one of those careers. We can think critically about many things in life when we know more about them. Going to college isn't always necessary, but for those who put in the work to get ready for it, it can be very beneficial. William Lyon Phelps, who used to be president of Yale University, is said to have said, 
The people who have the most interesting images in their brains are the most interesting people. The images we see in our minds are the beliefs we hold dear, which help to shape the path our lives take. On the other hand, this could be called our art gallery. Interestingly, once we hit 40 or older, our faces often start to look like that art museum. We are told that after age 40, it is our choice how our faces look. It makes sense that the information in our books should also be in theirs. Because of this, some middle-aged or older people are beautiful and appealing, while others aren't. Sadly, we see a lot of those who aren't. There is also the possibility that they have never been able to come up with a set of ideas that give them pleasure, happiness, and a hopeful view of the future. This is the case if they haven't been able to gather a bunch of good thoughts. Another thing that is true is that only a very small part of the community values the worth that great ideas bring to our daily lives. The most basic truth is that ideas are the most important thing in the world. While it's possible for someone to have attractive physical traits, the nothingness that comes from not having any great ideas is pretty clear to everyone. Before I went to sleep, I had a dream that my real life was full of endless happiness. Before I even opened my eyes, I knew that life was a duty. I did what I had to do, and to my surprise, it made me feel good. As I've gone on my inner journey, sticking to a certain set of values has helped me find peace and a sense of success. When the Calcutta-based Indian author Rabindranath Tagore wrote the song, he was bringing to light an idea that was very important to him. Getting things done for the people or group we have promised our lives to is one of the most satisfying things that life has to offer. Everyone has the right to choose how they want to make a living because we live in a democracy. The moment we become adults and can take care of ourselves, we are no longer required to do that. Doing our jobs to the best of our skills should be fun for us. If it doesn't, there must be a mistake in the system somewhere else. For example, it's possible that we were given the wrong tasks to do, or we may not have given our work the proper amount of thought it needs. Question. Are we as ready as we need to be right now, given the situation we're in? Our way of thinking might be wrong if the work we do doesn't seem to help us move up in our jobs. We might not be looking at things carefully enough or creatively enough. We aren't seeing all the ways that the work we are doing now could be used to show ourselves. We can't take advantage of the chances that are there for us because of this. Are we including the vast majority of people who seem to think they already know enough that they will learn more while they sleep? or that the knowledge they already have will be enough to get them through the rest of their lives. It seems fair to think that we will get the best service possible while having the least amount of product available. A lot of people think that getting a high school diploma or a college degree is like getting a vaccine against a disease. There is actually a name for this way of thinking about education, the vaccine hypothesis. It says that getting a license or degree is the end of official education. One college president says that as he walked toward the platform on the day of the graduation, he heard a senior telling another senior, thank God it's done. At the time, the president was also walking toward the platform. I've decided I will never read another book again as long as I live, he said. He said he had never heard such hurtful things. For some strange reason, that young man wasn't sold on the idea of getting an education, and it's interesting that he also didn't know what the word commencement meant. Education is a process that lasts a lifetime. It should end only when we do. However, commencement means the start of something, not the end of something. It is the start of our independence, but it's also the start of an education. Ideas especially great ideas that push us to be greater and larger than we are today, are the deeply entrenched anchors that will hold us in place steadfastly, even when the turbulent winds and seas of life crash about us. Ideas are the anchors that motivate us to be better and bigger than we are today. They act as the moorings that prevent us from being scared or derailed off our path by expediency, fad, or demagogy. 
They also function as the anchors that protect us from drifting aimlessly. Great ideas provide us with a set of senses that can pick up on dishonesty and phoniness, exposing what is cheap and poor, as well as what is frequently referred to as the easy buck. In other words, great ideas teach us how to spot dishonesty and phoniness. It is possible for us to keep our sense of humor while reaping the benefits of the lifelong security system that is provided for us by brilliant ideas. In fact, the introduction of such ideas provides a huge boost to our sense of humor, and as a result, smiling and laughing become vital components of our days. Expanding our horizons and delving into the unknown always leads to making mistakes. And although we are not immune to doing so, we are conscious that this is a natural and unavoidable part of the process if we want to be successful in reaching our goals. The ideas that we subscribe to should be compatible with those goals. What does the word concept really mean? People will yell, I have an idea, from time to time. Just what is it exactly? It is fairly likely that there is more to it than just a neurochemical and electrical response, despite the fact that it is both of those things. When previously obtained pieces of knowledge are integrated in such a manner as to yield an unanticipated outcome, this is the process that gives rise to an idea. You enthusiastically ask everyone else, shall we go to the beach? We don't even think about the known beach for a second before making our choice. We take one part, combine it with already existing transportation, proper attire, and maybe even a picnic lunch, and then present the combined whole as the idea to the people we are with at the moment. It all happens in the blink of an eye, even though our brains are simultaneously working on making a wide range of other ideas. When we set a meaningful goal for ourselves, we provide our brains with a problem that needs to be addressed and a challenge that has to be fulfilled in a manner that is both rewarding and beneficial. Instantaneously, the mind begins to work deep inside the labyrinthine interstices of its infinite potential in order to seek the information we need in order to turn that concept into a reality. This process may take a very long time. This extraordinary talent is often put to use in order to attain straightforward objectives. For example, the idea of owning a certain automobile swiftly materializes into an actual car that we may drive and clean on lazy Sunday afternoons when the weather is pleasant. It's likely that our trip from the time we receive the idea to the moment we get in the vehicle, turn the key, and drive away is quite convoluted or even circular, bringing us first here and then there. This is something we should keep in mind as we go forward. We might have saved ourselves a lot of trouble and made the process a lot less difficult if we had just paid attention to the guidance that keeps popping into our brains. On the other hand, the majority of the time we create obstacles for ourselves by disregarding the guidance that is provided to us only to discover at a later time that it would have been an excellent strategy to reduce the amount of work that was required of us. However, in the end, the notion, which was previously ethereal, materializes as sheet steel and glass, in addition to upholstery and rubber, and it also sometimes causes soreness in the neck. Although it will take us three years to pay for it, we will finally be able to make the notion a part of our everyday lives. This strategy for reaching our objectives is the wellspring of everything great that enters our lives during its course. It is the driving force behind our success. Quite frequently, it entails nothing more complex than a trip to the grocery store, a phone conversation, or an instruction issued to a teenager. The actualization phase occurs after the idea phase. It is still the same process that will end in satisfaction even if our ideas increase in degree, cost, and complexity. Alternatively, they will be frightened off by shyness, reasoning, or on occasion, just plain good common sense. It is still the same process that will end in fulfillment. Sometimes when we are toying with or fiddling with a beautiful idea, our mental process is overrun by other ideas, meaning that the particular tasty idea in question 
will have to be postponed for a year or two, maybe five years, or even longer than that. This means that the idea will have to be shelved for a longer period of time. Our style of thinking informs us, yes, it tells us that we have made the sort of quantum leap that is out of place if we are going to stick to our present objectives and ideals. If we are going to adhere to our current goals and ideas, this is problematic. If this is the case, then this is something that can be deduced from the way that we think about things. The ability to put off satisfaction for a longer period of time is generally seen as a sign of maturity. As a result of this, it is strongly suggested that the list be compiled on paper. However, this does not exclude the possibility that any of the things on the list might be subject to improvisation. It is not at all unusual for us, as we discover how fast such a system affords us fulfillment of our goals, to update our list to include levels that we may not have originally imagined were within the realm of possibility for us. This happens because we are learning how quickly such a system provides us with fulfillment of our objectives. In fact, it is not at all uncommon for us to realize how easily such a system affords us satisfaction of our objectives, and for us to then update our list to include degrees of pleasure that we would not have previously thought possible. It's also probable that we will discover a variety of degrees of satisfaction, with some things offering use more pleasure than we had anticipated, while others provide use with less pleasure. This is something that is quite often the case. Because of this, we will have to make some adjustments to the list in order to ensure that it is the most accurate reflection of our actual feelings. The primary advantage of creating a list like this is that it gives us the opportunity to realize that we can accomplish more in a shorter period of time than we may have thought possible. It also provides us with the ability to recognize the points of diminishing return so that we may choose to avoid them if we wish to. We are able to do this because we are able to understand that there is no reason for us to work harder than we need to in order to achieve our objectives. We are able to accomplish this by understanding that there is no reason for us to work harder than we need to in order to reach our objectives. It's basically just a list of things we want to accomplish in life. It's what all we think, say and do is based on. If we really think about this list, we will almost certainly be able to achieve our goals. Because of this, we will probably need to look at it every once in a while to make the necessary changes. This will help us stay focused on what we need to do. While speaking, someone else said, I've worked in this Navy Yard for 25 years. I am completely ignorant about everything. If we are to believe these individuals, then these humans were nothing more than human cattle that were kept in a single pasture and were only allowed to graze. There, they would do nothing except sit there and watch their lives pass them by. Since the pasture was no longer in its previous location over the course of 25 years, a person may, in their spare time, acquire the knowledge necessary to do heart transplants. What did all of these people do with the 16 hours that they had each day in which they were not required to work? What about the weekends and the times when there are no classes? Take out a calculator, some paper and some writing implements and calculate the number of hours that the average working person is actually present at their job each year. This will take some time. After that, subtract that amount of time from the total amount of time that person spent awake. If one spent one hour each day learning something new or participating in activities of a constructive nature, then the loss of a job would be a minor annoyance at worst, and it may even be seen as a good turn of events. And how about setting aside some time to just think? Any person who is accountable for the care of a family should, at the very least, have Plan A in place to cope with unforeseen circumstances, and ideally, they should have Plans A, B, and C. When in battle, a platoon leader has to constantly ask himself questions like, what if the enemy attacks at night? Are you coming up behind us on the weekend as we get ready for the week? The person who makes the most money for the family should ask, 
What do we do if my company goes out of business or fires me for some reason? Then make a rough draft of the solution on that legal pad. This is the kind of thinking that a husband and wife may undertake together, as well as separately, and as a result, they'll come up with a variety of choices for how to go forward in the situation. As a result of their efforts, and while we're at it, what are your thoughts on the possibility of enrolling in that educational program that is centered on your core area of interest? You should do all in your power to guarantee that the person you are today will not be the same person you are in five years. On the other hand, the personnel of the Navy Yard who were quizzed for that particular episode of television showed the same level of ignorance that they had shown 20 years before when I was a young kid of 12 years old. I questioned grown-ups and discovered that the adults were not one iota smarter than they had been when they were 15 years old. This was something that I discovered through my questioning of the adults. They have completely disabled their ability to think and acquire new information. They were living entities that responded in some way to stimuli of the simplest kind, but that was the end of their capacities. When they noticed that they were beginning to feel hungry, they set out on an adventure across the area in quest of something to eat. In that order, sleep, eating, and having sexual relations. The remainder of the time was taken up by whatever components of their reality happened to present themselves to them at that particular instant. They laughed throughout each episode of Jack Benny, Fibber McGee, and Molly, which they listened to on the radio and liked listening to. They giggled, slapped their legs, and shook their heads before returning to the regular state of semi-consciousness that they experienced when awake. During the economic turmoil that began in the 1980s, a familiar theme that we heard was, I worked for that firm for 30 years, and now I'm out of a job just like that. In other words, many lost their jobs suddenly after having worked for the same company for a long period of time. If you listen to them talk, you may get the sense that they had sacrificed some facets of their personal lives in order to secure the success of the company for which they worked. This is because you might get the impression that they compromised certain parts of their personal lives. They make no mention of the fact that the company reimbursed them for the time that they spent on the task and supplied them with the resources required to become anything they may have dreamed of being in the future. Both of these benefits were provided by the company. They were neither detained against their will nor coerced into doing the duty. Hence, the arrangement was reasonable and equitable. They applied for the job, which resulted in their acceptance, and they were paid an acceptable amount for the amount of work that they completed. There was no agreement in place to provide them with employment until they reached an age or had a physical condition that prevented them from continuing to work. Why didn't they take into consideration the possibility of getting fired and make preparations to cope with an issue that was completely out of the blue. My pals John and Elsie did. After John was fired from his job, he and Elsie made the decision to sell their house in Ohio and go to Florida, where they could spend their golden years in the pleasant climate and take advantage of their retirement. If he had been laid off a number of years earlier, they may have been able to turn their part-time real estate business into their full-time career. They bought, renovated, and sold real estate as part of their business. They would be fabulously rich right now if they had done what they could have done. The trouble for John and Elsie was that, like so many of us, they made the typical error of underestimating what they could achieve working for themselves. Given the amount of time that John was devoting to his job at the steel mill, the problem was that John and Elsie underestimated what they could accomplish working for themselves. Given the amount of time that John was devoting to his job at the steel mill, they did not quit the job voluntarily. Very often, due to the fact that it offered a consistent weekly income, which is something that the vast majority of people do not have. The vast majority of individuals, on the other hand, come to see their places of employment and the labor unions they belong to as parental figures, growing to depend on them for their safety 
and their ability to continue living, because the company is so big, with such large smokestacks, and because it employs so many people, and because it produces so much steel or anything else, it appears as though it will be there forever, and all they need to do to keep their job is show up to work, do whatever is required to keep it, and then go home. They don't have to stress about how they're going to fill the rest of their lives with all those uncountable hours, year after year, decade after decade. They can just let it pass with as little routine as possible. Why does no one care to engage these folks in a conversation on the subject of change? How is it that some people are able to isolate themselves from the knowledge that is pertinent to their situation? It would seem that they have totally wrapped themselves in ignorance, which is then wrapped in shiblets and myths. I know, I was a part of their community at the time. My eyes would be irreparably damaged if I continued to read that way, as my father often cautioned me to refrain from doing so. Reading doesn't hurt. It will be beneficial to the eyes in general, but the grey matter that is placed just behind them will benefit from it much more. But all of this is changing in a manner that is gradual but consistent. As time goes on, more and more people are joining the group that thinks, and this trend is expected to continue. In this world, thoughts and concepts are more important than anything else, and each one of us has a very unique ability for the processing of thoughts. The enormous brain that is characteristic of Homo sapiens, the only member of the genus Homo to have survived to the present day, is something that is present from birth and is considered to be standard equipment. As soon as a baby is born, we find ourselves in possession of a gorgeous living creature whose destiny is shrouded in a great deal of mystery for us. What mind-blowing ideas are going to spring out of that creature's head, and with such tools, what kind of life might this young person fashion for themselves? According to Peter Drucker, public education is an institution that was built for the maintenance of adolescence. It was immediately obvious to me that Drucker was educated in the subject area that he was addressing, as I was having a conversation with three high school kids one morning while we were eating breakfast. Obviously, having a conversation with three 17-year-old girls for a quarter of an hour does not qualify as an in-depth study. On the other hand, the people with whom I interact on a daily basis in my capacity as a sales clerk in shops and as a customer service representative on the telephony appear to provide very little in the way of encouragement. It is said that just 10% of all fishermen catch 80% of all the fish captured. Yet the average person who likes fishing is not an exceptionally skilled fisherman. The typical guy who goes fishing just because he loves it is not a very skilled angler. The average bowler is not very skilled at bowling, just as the average golfer is not particularly skilled at golf, and so on and so forth. Someone once remarked that the majority of us only do as much as we need to in order to get by without receiving an excessive amount of responsibility for our actions. This is a statement that has been made in the past. The expression, that's good enough, is one that is used rather often. Yet the normal understanding of this phrase is, it's actually not very good at all. It is possible that this is the narrative of the lives of a great number of people in the world's wealthiest nation, which also provides its residents with the greatest number of choices possible. It is sad that thinking was never required coursework at any of the public schools that I have been a part of throughout my education. Not remembering, which is what the vast bulk of the work that kids do in school is about, but rather thinking. Thinking a two, thinking a three, thinking a four, and so on, all the way up into the more advanced levels of university study and beyond. Unfortunately, it is not something that is taught in our school system, even though it is the highest conceivable function that a human being is capable of fulfilling. The act of considering is one that is performed without much thought. Every working person should be given a tape cassette program and printed material entitled Your Life and Your Work after successfully completing a training program offered by their firm. The program should be on a cassette and the content should be printed. The bulk of the material that we are going over here 
would be included in it, as well as other subjects such as basic aptitude tests, recommended savings plans, and emergency planning that are intended to aid the person in discovering the main area in which they have natural ability. This would be the case since it would be included in it. It is expected that the person will find all of this interesting. It provides us with choices, options, and even more possibilities, which is precisely what we need in order to construct the sorts of plans that would maximize, at least to some degree, who we are and what we are capable of achieving. It opens all kinds of wonderful windows of opportunity for us, providing us with choices, options, and even more options. Options, alternatives, and a greater number of possibilities. The phrase, you have lost your job, would be shown on the screen to introduce a part of the program with the same name. This section will answer the issue what can you do that the community wants or needs? With the understanding that the community refers to the whole of the United States of America and the free world. My great friend, Derm Barrett, who is a business consultant in Ontario, Canada, spent a total of 800 hours learning Spanish in such detail that he is now able to offer business seminars in a number of Latin American countries. Because of his extensive knowledge of the language, he is able to do this. It opened up a whole new world of options and things that attracted him that he might explore as a result of having access to this information. The entire amount of time invested was 800 hours. That is almost similar to the amount of time that the majority of people who are employed devote to their jobs. In only 20 weeks, learning Spanish will familiarize you with a culture that is both quite varied and highly intriguing, and it will do so in a way that is either all-encompassing or introductory, depending on your preference. And if there is any part of the globe that is in need of modern business knowledge, it would have to be Latin America. Over the phone, I could sense Derm Barrett's excitement and enthusiasm as he recounted how he had accepted the challenge of learning Spanish using his own ideas of time management and goal planning and how amazing the experiences that ensued were and are. He described how he had taken on the task of learning Spanish using his own ideas of time management and goal planning. He described how he had used his own ideas about how to schedule his time and achieve his objectives in order to meet the challenge of learning Spanish. His options had greatly broadened since then, and how much the natives admire us whenever we attempt to converse with them in their native tongue, which is not one of ours. It's possible that being fired from our jobs will turn out to be the best thing that ever happens to us. It forces us to do something that we were not able to muster the strength, creativity, or drive to accomplish when we had secure work and that is to go farther afield for opportunities that are greater and more attractive. This is a result of the fact that the job market has become more competitive. After the initial disbelief and a period of mourning, we often discover that we are now in a position of work that is far more to our liking, with many more opportunities for advancement than we were ever given by our old company. After we have recovered. From the first shock and despair, we often discover that our new line of employment is much more to our liking. Surveys of men and women who have attained remarkable success have shown that the job they left behind was strongly associated with their later accomplishments. This was the case both before and after they achieved success. It made no difference whether they had voluntarily quit the job or been fired from it. Either way, they were no longer employed there. Before joining our firm, every member of our management team cut their teeth in a variety of other fields, first in their own professions. That joy suffuses their hearts completely. The fact that they are now working and earning a higher income provides evidence in support of my theory. They are now enjoying work that is far more stimulating for them, and as a direct consequence, they are making more money than they ever had before in their lives. In the realm of business, the concept that we should focus our mental energy not only on things that are functioning poorly or might require some kind of adjustment, 
but also on things that are operating at their optimal level and generating the greatest amount of money is a good one, and it is supported by an enticing line of thought. This is because the idea that we should focus our mental energy on things that are operating at their optimal level and generating the greatest amount of money generates the greatest amount of money. If we apply what we know about business to our thinking, there is the greatest potential for profit. To put it another way, you should not wait until the very last second to think about something that is significant. Instead, while it is still operating at its optimal level, you should seek ways to improve and modernize it while it is still in operation. And this method of thinking is the one that is most beneficial to us in the long run. After you have already been let go from your present job, it is too soon to start thinking about potential new employment opportunities. Think about them when life is going well for you, when you are not experiencing any type of stress, and when you are not going through a period in which you are experiencing a decline in your sense of self-worth. Now pull out your reliable yellow legal pad and at the top of one of the pages write, I need better, more interesting and more gratifying employment. When put in such a position, the first question that comes to mind is probably, can I find it at the company where I am currently employed? What can I do for the company that I work for now? That will make a contribution to the business that is more significant than the job that I am doing right now. What am I able to accomplish that will make a contribution that is more significant than the job that I am doing right now? Another question that may be posed is, given the choice between this occupation and any other occupation in the world, which one would I like to perform for a living? And at this point, we may start creating a list of probable replies, which we will later rate and order according to the relative relevance of each of the responses that we have gathered. After each proposal, we need to ask ourselves, am I now ready to undertake such work? And what actions should I take to guarantee that I am adequately prepared for such work? You may also ask yourself, what is it that I am capable of achieving that will be of the most assistance to the people of this town, this state, this nation, or perhaps the whole world? Following this, there will be yet another list of the correct answers. The more we tinker with ideas like this, the more we'll be able to conceive of them. Each fresh concept gives birth to further ones, just as a fish lays eggs, and this process continues indefinitely. In addition, each of the eggs lays the groundwork for the development of more ideas. Now we're getting somewhere. Now that we are making use of the equipment that we were supposed to utilize, we are also making use of the object that we hold in the highest regard. Remember to constantly jot everything down and never think this way without a pen and paper, preferably a yellow pad. Always jot down anything you think if it is at all possible for you to do so. Continue writing page after page for as long as the ideas continue to come to you. When one looks into how they think, some individuals may discover that their thoughts come to them very slowly and painfully. This is something that may be discovered when one explores how they think. However, if you keep pushing yourself and reminding yourself that thinking is a painful process, you will find that the ideas flow to you more quickly and increase in quality. This may be accomplished by continuing to push yourself and by reminding yourself that thinking is a rigorous process. Do not give up the moment you have what can be considered your first intriguing idea. Continue your quest for new and improved ideas. After writing them down, underlining them, drawing a star next to them, or a circle around them, and so on, you'll find that fresh ideas continue to come to you, even after you've done all of these things. I find that getting up early in the morning is the ideal time for me to get things done, so I recommend that you do the same. Work on this in your spare time for many days and weeks until you have at least plan A worked out. If it doesn't work, go on to plan B. Have a conversation about the problems at hand with either your wife or your husband in order to get their perspective on the situation. Because of the new chances that have been available to you, 
you will quickly realize that you are grinning widely and are as content as a young kid. If you are not accustomed to writing, which is sadly the situation for millions of other Americans, please start getting in the habit of writing as soon as possible using your legal pad. If you are not used to writing, which is unfortunately the case for lots of other Americans, you should not for one second kid yourself into believing that you will be able to recollect all of the concepts that flow to the top of your head. Rather, you should scribble them down on some paper as soon as they come to you. If you want to improve your writing talents, there is a terrific way that is open to you, and it is as follows. Simply pick up any respectable book, read it, and then paraphrase what it says. While you are writing the text, be sure that you are copying all of the punctuation marks and paying attention to the beginning of each new paragraph as you go from page to page and word to word. When you read aloud while you're working on your writing, you will find that your speaking skills develop at the same time that your writing becomes easier to understand and more natural. Keep a dictionary accessible at all times and make it a practice to look up the meaning of any terms you come across that you are unfamiliar with. You may soon reach a place where writing is simple, fun, and undemanding for you. You will have all kinds of new horizons to explore, and you will begin to make use of the enormous potential that lies dormant within your brain. This is a result of the fact that you will have found that you have many interests that you never realized you had before, and you will be able to write about them all at once. You will be amazed at how swiftly you become well-versed on the subjects of your choosing, and you will be thrilled by the variety of ideas that come your way. This is all the result of the fact that you are now looking at the world in a completely new way. You will never be the same person you were in the past. You will have changed in some way. You will have changed in a good way. You will be better in every way. You surely have the power to outsource tedious jobs to other people. Nonetheless, you should not cease thinking about the future and making plans for it. If you don't, you'll die. As soon as a person is unable to participate in any activities that they like, the beginning of their protracted and gradual decline might be said to have occurred. They begin to come apart, and things in general start going in the wrong direction. After you've left this world, you'll at last be free to unwind and take it easy. People who never find themselves bored or without anything to do have a significantly increased likelihood of living a long and healthy life. They are farmers, which implies that in addition to fresh crops to plant and harvest, new cows to milk, and a hundred other things that need their attention at the same time, they also have new crops to sow. They may be teachers who begin the new school year with a whole new class, or writers who conclude a piece on one subject before moving on to another. Either way, they begin their work on a fresh topic, and they are the type of people who never find themselves at a loss for novel ideas. When they do, in the end, reach the conclusion of their lives, their image gradually disappears, as if it were being removed from a film that was being shown at the cinema, but suddenly ceased operating. Reading Ortega has shown us that humans are the only creatures on the whole planet that are born in a state of natural perplexity with our world. This was an interesting and eye-opening discovery for us. Reading provided us with the necessary information to acquire this knowledge. Every other recently hatched species seems to be adapting extremely well to the new habitat in which it finds itself. They never have to ask themselves, what will I do? Because they are completely ruled by their feelings and respond instinctively to anything that affects them. This means they don't have to think about the question, why were we stopped from reaching this certain level of development? We are the only known species that can create our very own universe entirely within the context of the one that already exists and of which we are a part. Having the power to do so is quite remarkable because the ideas we have such a significant impact on our lives. It stands to reason that ideas are among the most important things in the world. Unhappily, for far too many of us, the lack of great ideas, rather than the existence of such ideas, 
is the primary factor that shapes our lives. A poet had penned the line, Blessed is the man who has discovered his job in the past. Without a doubt, a clever suggestion. The man or woman who identifies an area of study that may be explored indefinitely has a tremendous amount of untapped potential for their own life's trajectory. Permit me to emphasize yet another fantastic idea for you. Such work is accessible to each and every one of us. If we have not found it yet, the most effective course of action that we can take is to keep seeking it until we find it. There is nothing more that can be done on our end. Another wonderful idea is that the honors and accolades bestowed upon us throughout the course of our lives will be precisely proportionate to the amount of service we have rendered. We have come together to assist one another in whatever way we can over the rest of our lives.